Hi everyone, welcome to this new session on uh, Amazon SageMaker. If you have any questions, please uh, submit them via the questions pane on the control panel and I will answer them at the end. A copy of the slides can be found in the handout tab on the control panel and you will get a copy of the recording in a follow-up email after the event. In this session, I'm going to dive even deeper on SageMaker and uh, this is actually zero slides, or almost. And we're going to talk about Amazon SageMaker Model Debugger and how it helps uh, inspecting what's going on during model training. And then we'll uh, look at Amazon SageMaker Model Monitor, which helps you find um, data quality and, and prediction quality issues once your models have been deployed, okay? So let's jump straight into the notebook. This notebook is available on GitLab, and uh, here I'm going to use the XJBoost algo to build a classification model on a direct marketing data set. So I'm not going to dive too deep on the data set and, and uh, the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, I'm actually going deeper into this in the next session, uh, which is uh, more obsessed about uh, performance and accuracy. Here uh, we want to inspect and and uh, and monitor. So it's not so much about getting uh, great accuracy. So in a nutshell, this is a direct marketing data set. It's a supervised learning problem classifying customers into two classes: uh, customers who accept an offer, customers who don't. Okay, so kind of a yes or no problem. So uh, the first step is to download the data set, extract it, and uh, we can take a look with pandas, right? Uh, so it's a CSV file, a whole bunch of features, and a Y column saying yes or no, did the customer accept the offer, okay? Then I'm doing some uh, some basic pre-processing, but again, I'm not going to, uh, uh, to look at this now because I'm not uh, concerned with this at the moment. Um, so basic processing, then split the data set and, uh, and upload everything to S3, okay? So I have a training set, I have a validation set, and I have a test set, okay? And I have the three locations for those three data sets, okay? So now we want to train a model, okay? So if you worked with SageMaker before, you know this means using an estimator. Okay, um, I'm using a built-in algo here, so I'm using this estimator object, which is the uh, the generic algo for uh, for built-in. Uh, sorry, the generic. So I'm using the estimator object, which is the generic object for built-in algos. First, I grab the name of the container image for XGBoost in the region I'm running in, and I am configuring the estimator. And yes, it is quite a mouthful because I try to fit as much as I could in there. So we're going to take it step by step. Let's look at the, uh, the bits that we probably already know. Okay, so the bits we all probably already know are these, right? Uh, we need to pass the name of the container. So basically selecting the algo we want to, uh, we want to use. We pass an IAM role to give uh, SageMaker permissions to access S3, pool Docker containers, etc., etc. Uh, the session, which is a technical object. Then we use file mode to say we want to copy the data set to the instance before training. We define the location, uh, the output location for the model, and we define how much infrastructure we want. Okay, so here we're training on one ML M4 to Excel instance. Okay, so if you work with SageMaker before, and even if you haven't, I guess you know these are very simple, very reasonable. Okay, um, the next bit is about using spot instances. Okay, so spot instances are a great way to save money. Uh, they've been available on EC2 for a long time. They are now available on SageMaker. So just say, hey, I want to use spot instances for training. My max training time is this, and my total time, so training time plus waiting for spot uh, is this, okay? 
So that's how you control how much time you're ready to wait for spot instances if they're in really high demand. Okay, fine. So let's look at the next bits. Okay, so the next bits are actually new stuff. Um, let's look at this one first. Okay, so this is the debugger configuration. Okay, and as you can imagine, this is an object coming from the SageMaker debugger SDK. Okay, and this is how we're going to enable um, SageMaker debugger for this training job. Okay, so let me explain what SageMaker debugger does. So what it does is as your job is running, it's going to save uh, model information. So tensors, okay, tensors are uh, high dimensional arrays that represent the state of the model, uh, parameters, uh, gradients, uh, weights, if you use uh, deep learning, etc. And that model state is going to be saved uh, periodically during the training job. And of course, it's going to be saved to S3, as you can see here, okay? So the high level ID is we save that stuff periodically to S3, okay? And later on, we're going to be able to look at it, okay? And understand what happened in that training job, uh, potentially looking for bizarre conditions or just, you know, plotting metrics and whatnot, okay? So that's a super easy way to save model state uh, periodically, okay? And that's what we see here. So we define collections for the different tensors. So we have metrics, and of course, these are predefined names. Uh, we have feature importance. That's a really nice one, as we'll see, telling us which features in the data set contribute the most to the uh, predicted outcome by XJBoost. And then we pass the save interval. Okay, so do we want to save at every step or every five steps or 10 steps? Or here I'm saving all steps, okay? Literally saving everything. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. And we'll see how this actually happens, but this is how you configure it. Uh, this is how you configure the, the saving part of debugger, okay? But it's not just about saving, okay? Uh, it would be nice already if we, uh, if we were able to, uh, to look at that model state after training is complete. Um, but we can actually define rules, okay? So we can actually um, ask SageMaker Debugger to check for unwanted conditions during the training job. So we have a list of uh, built-in rules that you'll find in documentation and you could add your own okay so you could write your own python code to inspect your tensors and check for you know weird stuff happening there so here um, i'm using a rule a built-in rule called class imbalance because as it turns out this is a very imbalanced data set about eight to one and well, building classifiers for imbalanced data set is more difficult. Okay, so I wanna make sure that this training job is not suffering from that imbalance rule, okay? And I could further configure this, uh, but you'll find this information in the, uh, in the doc, okay? So here I'm just saying, hey, keep, your, keep an eye out for class imbalance weirdness during the training job and uh, and use that stuff to look at metrics, basically, okay? So that's what SageMaker Debugger does, okay? One, it will save uh, defined tensor collections to S3 so that you can inspect them, okay? And two, uh, it configures rules that are checked during training, okay? Um, to make sure your training job is not suffering for from something uh, uh, undesirable um, and uh, and just weird. Okay, so uh, just on the top of my mind, uh, you can check for uh, you know loss not decreasing and uh, uh, vanishing gradients and exploding tensors and a whole bunch of things. Okay, and yes, they all have uh, very funny names. Okay, so please take a look at the doc for more. 
All right, so this is my estimator, okay? Uh, the uh, usual part and more stuff for debugger. Okay, next, uh, I'm just setting some hyperparameters, okay? And as you can see, I'm <laughs> actually very reasonable here for once. I am not setting any crazy ones because once again, uh, I am not really uh, trying to get to a high performance model here. I'm just trying to show um, those uh, those new capabilities. If you're curious about optimizing uh, hyperparameters, etc., that's the next session. Okay, so don't miss it. Okay, and then I call fit, and my training job starts. Okay, and let's take a look at the log. So we see the usual stuff. Uh, start the training job, launching instances, etc., and well, we we see new stuff as well. Okay. Uh, we see debugger rule status, class imbalance in progress. So, and then we see pretty much the, the training job as usual. So what's this bit? So what this means is based on the configuration above, okay, here, we configure one rule. Well, we see uh, SageMaker firing up in parallel of the training job, and another job for that debugging rule. Okay, and we, we have one job per rule. So if we'd configured, let's say, five debugging rules, then we would see five debugging jobs. Okay, and as you can imagine, what these jobs do is they look in real time, as they become available, they look at the tensors that are saved in S3, and they check for uh, whatever condition they've been uh, set up for. Okay, so there's code looking at tensors and applying that logic trying to figure out yes or no is class unbalance a problem or is loss not decreasing etc etc okay so that's a separate job um, running in parallel okay all right so we see our job we see ah, very nice uh, savings from spot okay so 66.7 percent that's very nice uh, we saved two-thirds of the of the training cost, so make sure you know how to uh, use spot instances and decrease your SageMaker bill. Okay, uh, we'll talk about cost optimization some more at the end, um, as uh, promised in the session description. But as you can see, uh, uh, spot is already a very nice way to save money. Okay, uh, I can check the the condition of that uh, debugging job uh, as the training job is going. Okay. Uh, so here, when I checked, was in progress. Now, for sure, it's done. And um, if something happens, which I don't think happened here, uh, if the rule is actually triggered, then uh, the debugging job stops and your training job stops as well, because there's really no point in continuing training if something is not going well. It's just a waste of uh, time and money. So uh, if a rule is triggered, then um, the debugging job will let you know something went wrong and uh, and the training job, the corresponding training job will be stopped. Okay, so uh, no need to, uh, if you have uh, vanishing gradients for deep learning jobs that train for seven days, uh, well, you know, you might as well save that time and money, okay? So once the job is over, uh, so whether it successfully uh, completed or not, you can go and explore those tensors in S3, okay? And you need to do that using that SDK for SM uh, SageMaker debuggers, debugger. Um, basically find uh, the path for the artifact. So basically where did we save the tensors and then create a trial from, uh, from that, okay? And once you have that, then uh, you can start exploring your data okay so there's not enough time to cover the the full API of the the trials SDK but again all the documentation is online but basically uh, you can see uh, you can access a specific tensor by name and you can get all the steps okay remember we save data periodically okay so you can get the tensor values for every step and uh, and then you get here we're building a, as you can see we're building a, a python list and returning uh, 
uh, a list of steps and a list of values okay so we we have basically all the history for that tensor over time okay and we can plot it using matplotlib so here's an example okay where we plot uh, for that trial we plot our metrics so we can see in that metrics collection we actually had two individual values we had the uh, area under curve which was the the metric configured for that training job and we have that for the training set and we have that for the validation set okay so we can see all the values over time um, and uh, and that's already very useful right pretty easy to do that okay and I guess we could have continued training for a bit more or not but doesn't matter at this point okay so you can easily access just like that okay basically those three those two three lines okay access uh, tensors by name and uh, get all their steps and get all the values for the steps okay again full history over uh, those uh, uh, model uh, 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 model values and model states okay so that's pretty cool you don't need to write any bespoke code to do that uh, remember we saved another collection we saved feature importance okay so feature importance once again uh, will tell us um, which feature contributes most to the prediction okay and our uh, our data set here as uh, 60 plus features because we use a one hot encoding on categorical variables etc so it's actually much more than the 20 columns we had originally and uh, and we can see that okay so if we plot that then we see that feature okay the orange one I believe is this one f1 okay and this one is f5 okay so we see that feature one and feature five are uh, the important ones okay <laughs> which is good because that's exactly what the comment says here and uh, so feature one is actually the job it's the number of the column right in the in the csv file so there's no uh, there's no magic on those numbers uh, so does that person have a job and uh, how is it uh, housed um, is it uh, you know is it uh, renting or is, is that person renting or is that person owning uh, these are I guess important factors in you know how much money you can generally spend so uh, so not surprising to see them as uh, highly contributing to whether you would accept a marketing offer or not okay so this is really really cool because um, you you certainly heard about model explainability uh, well this is it right so uh, if you train a classification model and you see that okay job and housing are important factors then you can compare that to the uh, to the legacy solution that you have uh, maybe it's an IT application or maybe it's just humans looking at uh, uh, forms and deciding yes or no should they get uh, you know should they get that offer um and you know it helps you understand what's going on inside the model okay and this is super easy just save the tensors and uh and just plot that stuff okay again there are some additional details here on on uh, feature importance and it's all in the doc but you can see just copy paste that code it it'll work out of the box with with your own model okay so there you there you are uh that's uh um, a first example of uh, SageMaker debugger okay so you can do much more um, I'm just gonna give you a taste of uh, what's possible here and I'm gonna jump to uh, the A Amazon SageMaker examples uh, repository on github um, which is amazing and uh, it has hundreds and hundreds of notebooks showing you how to use SageMaker in all kinds of ways and there's a specific uh, directory here for SageMaker debugger and well I have to say these are even more amazing honestly I'm still going through some of those um, but here you see you know um, how deep down you can go and literally rip the guts of your model and um, 
and there are some really amazing examples on uh, uh, deep learning, right? Uh, so if you want to look at one of them, I guess we can maybe take a look at this one really quickly. So this one shows you how to do model pruning. So model pruning is an advanced technique where during training, you look at deep learning um, uh, connections, right? So uh, neuron connections, and you figure out how much they contribute to the output. So it's kind of similar to that feature importance example that we saw, except here we go one step further and we say, hey, if a certain filter, or if a certain um, a convolution operation does not contribute to, to the outcome, then we remove it, okay? So this is an amazing notebook, and uh, I'll just go all the way to the end, okay? And this, this animation here shows you over time, uh, over 10 iterations that you know, we keep removing parameters in that uh, deep learning model. Okay, it's a PyTorch model. And of course, we shrink the model accordingly, right? We go from 200 plus megs to about 70 megs. And uh, we hardly lose any accuracy. So we shrink the model by a factor of three. And we hardly lose any accuracy because we just drop parts of the of the model that just do nothing for us okay um, so this is a very very advanced example um, and uh, if you're into deep learning and computer vision I mean yeah, yeah you're gonna love this one uh, but not all of them are as <laughs> hardcore as this uh, we have some uh, XG boost examples as well uh, we have some uh, you know slightly uh, slightly easier ones but again if you want to really, really dive deep on uh, on SageMaker Debugger, just go check those notebooks, spend time to read the code and run them. And uh, and again, you'll be able to tear your model apart and, uh, and understand exactly what's going on. Okay, so really, really cool stuff here. Okay, um, so that's, that's it for SageMaker Debugger. We could spend, you know, hours on this, but hey, uh, I'm uh, I'm limited for time. Ask me your questions. Uh, happy to answer questions after the after the session. Okay, so we saw how to save model state, inspect inspect it, etc. Now let's talk about another capability, uh, which is SageMaker Model Monitor. Okay, so SageMaker Model Monitor will help us do two things. First, it's going to help us save um, data that is sent to our model in production, okay? So let's say we deployed a model on a real-time endpoint and we're able to capture data sent to that endpoint and we're able to capture um, predictions, okay? So incoming and outgoing data, request response, if you will, save everything to S3 and, and look at it, run analytics, etc. And we're gonna be able to do much more. Uh, but I'm gonna keep some uh, some tension here. Uh, let's just look at capturing data first. So going back to the model that I trained, I'm going to call deploy on that estimator as usual. Okay, give an endpoint name, give some infrastructure requirements, and aha, here's new stuff again. Uh, we pass a data capture config coming from here. Okay, from the model monitor SDK. And what do we say here? We say, hey, please capture. Okay, <laughs> I guess that kind of makes sense. Um, please capture everything, okay, 100% of data, right? You could sample down if you wanted. Uh, by default, we're going to capture incoming and outgoing data, so data samples and predictions. And we're going to put all that stuff in S3 here. Okay, very simple object, okay? So as you can see here, we're enabling data capture at deployment time, but if you have an existing endpoint, you can do the same, okay? All you have to do is you create a new endpoint configuration with a data capture config object, and you update the endpoint configuration with that new, uh, with that new endpoint, 
okay so that's uh, that's all it takes right all right after a few minutes this is live and it's an endpoint so we can send it some data right so just loading some uh, test samples using the uh, invoke endpoint api from uh, boto3 sending data getting predictions back okay and this is just an excuse to uh, uh to uh, log some stuff of course okay and if i look in uh, my capture path i can see files right so i can see i have a file here okay a json lines file containing uh, incoming and outgoing data and i can copy it to my local uh, notebook instance and i can take a look at it okay and well what do we see exactly what we thought we'd see i suppose we see uh, input data which is csv data right and then i see my uh, my data point here all the way through here okay my features and then i see the output okay and the output is basically the zero to one probability for that sample okay remember it's a binary classification model so we get a probability between zero and one okay and we see whole, a whole bunch of that okay so again this is already very useful because um you know if you want to uh to monitor data if you want to capture data and replay it right if you want to do back testing uh, you could say well okay let's capture real real life data and we can replay that stuff uh in a in a dev or, or test environment uh you know no code to write the only thing that we've done was that uh, data capture config object on um, on the endpoint right so this is already pretty nice okay and then we do batch prediction because why not okay and uh that's it okay so this is the capture part right but model monitor actually goes uh, a little uh, further than this okay and once again let me show you more examples so in that same repo okay say to make your examples you have uh, a directory for model monitor and you have some examples here and i'm gonna show you a little bit more uh, because i have a little bit more time okay so um in this notebook we're actually using a different data set but it, again it doesn't really matter we can just focus on uh, on the model monitor part so what we do here is actually we take an existing model okay this is a churn prediction model um, so probably again a binary classifier uh, a model that has already been uh, trained okay and uh, we uh, import it we deploy it on SageMaker we set up data capture exactly the same way capture everything uh, we deploy it right and this is a good example of the modularity of SageMaker see we're just taking a model that you could have trained on uh, on another machine on your laptop maybe and you can very easily deploy it on SageMaker okay then we send it some data okay just like we've done in the previous example we see capture files we can see what's inside those files okay so json uh, lines format exactly the same all right so this is really what i've done in my previous example but again we can go further we could say okay so we have data capture we have um uh, that stuff ready to uh, ready to run and actually already running so now we could say well um, it'd be nice if we could compare uh, incoming data okay real life data uh, sent to my endpoint to the data that i use to train the model okay and well you can absolutely do that so uh, the first step is to generate a baseline okay so generating a baseline means uh, you're going to compute some statistics using the training set okay so here we upload the training set to s3 and we create a baseline okay so we launch uh, a specific job that will 
load the training set, as you can see here. And it's going to compute all kinds of statistics on it. It's going to figure out um, uh, feature types, feature ranges, um, feature distributions, etc., etc. Okay. If you're a data scientist, you certainly do that manually already. Okay. But here you can automate that. Okay. So we can see that job running here. And by the way, this is based on another SageMaker capability called SageMaker Processing that makes it easy to run uh, scikit-learn or uh, Spark processing jobs on data. And you can use it in many different ways, uh, pre-processing data or computing stats or you know, running batches of uh, 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 batch processing on your data pretty much. Okay, And that's a service in itself, uh, but hey, uh, it's integrated here. Okay, so just compute that baseline and it runs for a bit. Okay, let's not look at that. Okay, and once the job is over, uh, we can see some results. So we can see statistics on the data and constraints. Okay, and uh, basically what that means, if we look at, uh, at that data here, we can see for each feature what type it is okay is it an integer is it uh, uh, is it a float is it something else um, we can see if we have missing values for that feature okay so apparently not okay we have uh, all features are present in all samples we can see stats okay so we see distributions uh, using KLL. Uh, if you do that stuff for a living, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if not, I don't worry about it. Okay, it's just a very fast way to compute distributions. Um, and there's a whole lot of stuff here, right? So if you're into stats, you're gonna love this. A mean, uh, standard deviation, etc., etc. Okay, so all that stuff is just automated away. Okay. Um, and now that we know what uh, clean data looks like, okay, hopefully the data set is a clean one, um, of course, we can compare incoming data um, to that, okay? And the way we're gonna do this is we're going to create a monitoring schedule, which is going to look at capture data. Remember, okay, we're capturing incoming data. And it's going to look periodically at that data and it's going to run those same statistics okay, and constraints on that incoming data and it's going to look for discrepancies. Okay, It's going to look for differences. So um, if everything's fine, then okay. Uh, if things are not fine, <laughs> that's going to tell us. And um, so this is going to alert us to problems like uh, missing features, um, mistyped features uh, or drifting features which are even worse where the distribution of a feature is now different because whatever you know because the real world is ever changing and i think we have good proof at the moment so um, uh, maybe the hypothesis that were true on your data set a month ago are not uh, true anymore and of course this would mess with your predictions very badly because uh, all those machine learning algorithms use statistics and distributions so if those uh, hypotheses are you know shifting then uh, predictions will shift and uh, and the quality of your predictions are going to degrade over time okay and this is a very nasty problem and it's very difficult to track yes maybe you see uh, your business KPI going down because your predictions are not so relevant, but why, you know, why is that KPI going down? Well, okay, this could be one of the reasons, okay? Um, and of course, you could, you, it could just be bugs, right? Uh, maybe something in your ETL workflow is broken uh, and, uh, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, data is not, is not what it should be, or maybe a web app upstream is just... Uh, uh, you know, it's just buggy and, and dropping features or adding extra crappy features, whatever, you know, it's software, anything can happen. 
and uh, and all of it would impact your model. So uh, that's that's not very good. Okay, so that monitoring schedule is what is going to uh, uh, fix that for you. Okay. All right. So next, um, we're going to start generating traffic, and uh, and of course we break it on purpose. Okay, and we break it on purpose because we're uh, <laughs> applying buggy preprocessing to uh, to that data. Okay, so uh, so this is a buggy code that arbitrarily and randomly breaks uh, incoming data. Okay, so uh, take a look at that. And so that traffic is going to be um, is going to be bad, bad traffic, right? It's going to be garbage. And so, after a while, you know, once our monitoring schedule uh, uh, kicks off, okay. And of course, uh, here I think we have an hourly schedule, but uh, you can you can configure that. Uh, so after an hour, it's gonna it's gonna fire up, and and of course it's going to crunch the data that. Uh, we captured, and okay, and remember this is bad data because we literally broke it for our testing purposes. And we then see that, oh, hmm, that monitor, monitoring schedule did run, but, uh, and it completed, but it detected violations. So violations are basically um, data that doesn't uh, look like the training set, okay? Which is what we want here, we broke it, okay? So we can go and grab the reports, okay, for those uh, monitoring schedules. And there is a violation report, which we can visualize. And here, well, what did we do? Um, well, I guess we broke, uh, yeah, so we expected uh, integers and maybe we did pass strings or something. So I think we, you know, we messed up uh, we messed up a number of features, um, yeah, in the processing script, and these are picked up. Okay, so uh, again, this is just one of the violation. Uh, here we just messed with the data type, but if you had uh, different statistical properties, those would be highlighted as well. Okay, so this is a really really cool uh, uh, capability, if you ask me, because it it just runs in the background, you know, and it it, it will catch. It will catch that stuff, and uh, and then you can go and look at those and and try to understand. Okay, is that my ETL chain, um, um, you know, messing with my data, or um, did a feature disappear from my data set because maybe you know maybe my web app is not logging it any longer? Uh, you know, it, it it basically points you at uh, the the problem, and then you can go. And investigate more but at least you know what to look for you know what was wrong in that sample that you received okay and then you can uh, you know you can start and stop your schedules and you can delete them uh, if you want um, just so you know uh, you can't delete an endpoint if it has an active monitoring schedule so you need to make sure if you get that error uh, you need to delete the monitoring schedule first and then you'll be able to delete the endpoint okay all right. Well, I think that's it for uh, for model monitor. And again, uh, we have more uh, more notebooks here, and uh, including visualization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, both these uh, uh, debugger and model monitor uh, notebooks are really really awesome. So uh, spend some time, you know, read documentation first, go through the the basic examples, and then you can dive deep into that and and set this up. And both capabilities really will save you so many hours of you know, uh, frustration trying to understand why is your training job not going right and why is my model not predicting right. And uh, these are great, great uh, productivity improvements and, uh, and uh, we get a really good feedback from customers. So uh, please try them out and, uh, and let us know. Okay, uh, just, uh, just a few more things. Uh, I promised I would talk about cost optimization for a second. Uh, so the reason why I'm, I'm including this in this uh, session is because um, usually uh, I see a lot of customers who, you know, first they try to get a hang of SageMaker and then they get productive and they deploy and they really love the fact that they can uh, uh, launch all that infrastructure on demand. 
etc etc and uh and then you know it scales very nicely but if you don't pay attention then um you could end up uh spending a little more money than uh, you expected okay so you have to be careful there and uh and i wrote a blog post uh well, over a year ago already but uh, it's been updated uh, post reinvent with all the new launches and uh, and this is on my medium blog uh, and I, I pretty much uh, walk through all the steps. So data preparation, um, using uh, managed services like uh, like EMR instead or Glue, uh, which is a really cool tool for machine learning as well. Instead of trying to write your uh, bespoke code on EC2, uh, ground truth for labeling, which uh, will save you lots of time and money. And then, um, you know, uh, handle, working with notebook instances, right? Stopping them when you don't need them, right sizing them, using local mode. I mean, if you've never heard of all those things, uh, if local mode means nothing to you, then you're probably spending too much money, okay? So go through that blog post, tick all the boxes, and, uh, and send me a tweet telling me how much money you saved, okay? Um, Managed spot training we saw is a, is a fantastic way to save, you know, easily 60, 70 percent on training jobs. Again, right sizing, um, working with your data set in the right format, streaming with pipe mode. Again, if you have a large data set and you've never heard of pipe mode, please take a look. Uh, I have a really fantastic guest post from uh, uh, Haim Hond, uh, an engineer with uh, Mobileye. Well, we're working at very large scale with TensorFlow, and they, this is really you know, all the knowledge you need on pipe mode. Um, then optimizing models, model tuning, autopilot, um, optimizing prediction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, as you can see, there are so many things you can do on cost optimization. Elastic inference. Okay, if you deploy on GPU instances and you never looked at elastic inference. Uh, I can pretty much guarantee that you're, you know, probably wasting quite a bit of money. So take a look here. Inferentia is a great, uh, it's a great new capability as well with a custom chip for a super high throughput um, uh, prediction. You know, much more efficient than GPUs, etc., etc. Right, the list goes on, and uh, I keep updating this post every time. So um, long story short. If you've never worried about cost optimization, and uh, you know, even if you're uh, working at small scale, and if you're working with GPU instances, etc., please take a look at this blog post. Um, I, I got a lot of good feedback on it, and um, you know, I, I want you to spend exactly what you need to spend, and not a penny more. So, uh, so please read this. Uh, if you have other techniques to share, uh, I'm happy to uh, add them to the post. Um, again. Uh, Lots of money to save if you do things right here. Okay. All right. I think we're almost done. So uh, if uh, if you want more content, uh, well, of course, you can go and read the SageMaker documentation, but I guess you figure that out. Um, I have plenty of um, machine learning blog posts on the AWS blog, and uh, that's a good way to uh, keep an eye out for new stuff because uh, there will be new stuff all the time. Uh, my Medium blog, which uh, I just showed you, uh, my YouTube channel, where there's a, quite a bit of uh, SageMaker videos and, and uh, the video version of my podcast as well. The audio podcast is on Buzzsprout. And uh, I'm always happy to, uh, to chat and answer questions on Twitter, so feel free to ping me. My direct messages are open. And, uh, and you know, don't hesitate if there's anything uh, I can help you with or if you're looking for resources I can quickly point you to that okay so thanks again uh, this was a pretty dense session uh, on uh, SageMaker debugger and SageMaker model monitor I hope you learned a lot and uh, now we're available to answer your questions and once again thank you very very much for attending and uh, I hope you're safe wherever you are okay see you soon bye bye